Hello, my name is Ian Beabout, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I am joined by my friend Mike Lieto, uh, who some of you may remember from the Deep Cuts days, uh, or perhaps even the recent bursting out discussion that we did here uh, with our buddy Jocko. Today, we're going to talk about King Crimson, and this was specifically inspired by a comment that I received on my review of the album, The Construction of Light. And uh, somebody posted a ranking of the King Crimson records, and I kind of sent that to you. And I was like, Mike, look at this. This is wild. Like, this this guy says Red is like his least, least favorite. <laughs> that was wild. That was really wild to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but but it just... it. You know, it's like fascinating. It's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's his opinion. And it's like, you know, I was kind of glad that he shared it with us, even though it is it's like, wow, so I. I've never unique. heard that take before. I appreciate it. Um, but it did get us to talking like, well, what are what are our favorite King Crimson records? And um, first we were going to do like a ranking video, a conventional ranking video. Um, and then I thought th then we started talking about like, well, hey, let's talk about all of the albums. Let's do a review of all, what is it, 12, 13? 13, 13 depending yeah. On? 13, okay. I'm sure this is an issue with most King Crimson fans. Is that an album or not? We're talking about the main albums, too. Like, if you yes. talk about the full discography, there's a bazillion live albums. There's, like, four EPs, another album that may or may not be King Crimson, the Project albums, et cetera, et cetera. Right. We are going to stick to the studio albums. I listen to each one of these studio albums in order of release. Um, and this is the first time I've ever done this. I did that also with for you. any band. Yeah. And you did it with me. I think what we're going to do is we're going to start um, with the first album in the court of the crimson King. And we're going to provide a little mini review. How do we feel about it? And we're going to do this for each album. We're going to do this through um, the power to believe uh, 2003. So <clears throat> let's start with the beginning the Court iconic of the crimson king with my think the best album artwork period <laughs> definitely barry godber um who Rest died yeah. yeah he died within i mean like a few weeks or months of uh painting it it's a watercolor is that right is yeah it, it's a and watercolor? it only has five colors in it which is amazing it's a self-portrait did you know that I did not know that, actually. So it's got all this mystique and just um, legend around this this yeah. record as soon as it's released. In the Court of the Crimson King encapsulates the first era of King Crimson, King Crimson Mark I, which is Robert Fripp on guitar, Ian McDonald on saxophones and woodwinds Mellotron, Michael Giles on the drums, and um, Greg Lake on bass and vocals, and Peter Sinfield on words and stage lights and Lighting. all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that band was essentially lightning in a bottle. They existed for, what was it, like 10 months or something? And then yeah. dissip essentially dissipated. Um, but my God, where did they make a splash and a half? Uh, and this album is the attempt to capture the amazing energy this group had in the studio. And it's very successful. But I was in ninth grade when I first heard King Crimson. This is not the first King Crimson record I heard, I don't think. But it is one that, you know, made an immediate impression. I mean, how can you not hear 21st Century Schizoid Man for the first time and not be like, oh, my God, what is this? You know, it turns your entire world around. Um, I have I can't tell you how many times I've spun this record. It's so important. There was a time in my life where this was the best album I've ever heard and was my favorite for quite a long time. Um, it's still right up there. Um, I think there's a few that kind of trumpet now, but it's still, you know, really important to me as a person. Um, and plus it's got, I think Ian has, and I've been talking about this stuff a lot in preparation for this video. I think I share his opinion that in the court of the Crimson King is my favorite song on here. Um, it yeah. is such, such a perfect piece of music. There's, in my opinion, three Crimson records that completely changed the face of music, which is unbelievable for one band to have. But yeah. it's this one, Lark's Tongue and Aspic, and Discipline. And this one probably made the biggest notable, like, you know, splash. Because, like, yeah. you know, the, the I don't think 
I honestly share Robert Fripp's opinion that King Crimson really aren't a progressive rock band. They're their own thing. But this album started the prog genre, really. Mm-hmm. Like there's like, you know, inklings and stuff that's kind of progressive before this. Like the Moody Blues are doing some really cool stuff. Proko Harum, you know, bands like that. But when this came out, there was nothing like this. My only note on this album is to talk about Michael Giles and how unbelievable he is on the drum kit. You know, he really, I think, shapes the entire musical landscape of this album. Yeah. The well, stuff he plays is groundbreaking. <laughs> the quality of a drum part is how easily it can be sung, um, sort of in the way that, you know, like a melody would mm-hmm. work for another instrument. And I think that uh, Michael Giles' introduction to In the Court of the Crimson King is breathtaking. It's yeah. breathtaking music. It is. <laughs> and I'm talking about just the fill. I, I feel much the same way you do. Um, and I thought this was a good enough opportunity to yeah. show that I've been doing my homework. Uh, this is the complete 1969 recordings, and I'm currently fighting the glare. This is every recorded note uh, that has survived, that exists, uh, of the 1969 band. And that includes like 12 hours of recording sessions, um, live performances, the famous gig at uh, Hyde Park. The marquee gig is here too, is the next night. Um, but uh, you also have two 5.1 mixes and one Atmos mix of the album. So th- this is an incredible treasure trove of material. The mere presence of that in my collection should tell you what this album means to me. And the way that this album was introduced to me was this is progressive rock. Um, it was a case of, um, you know, I was probably the same age you were, maybe a little younger, but it was over the summer. Um, I was, um, listening to music with my dad and I said, uh, is there anything else that you have that I might like? And, uh, he pulled a copy of this album down from the higher shelf and put it on. And I, I just remember that it was like, oh my God, like, this is music that I've only dreamed of. And I'm just talking about 21st century schizoid man. Um, that, that song alone was enough to, to grab me. And, um, you know, that, that was the moment when I became addicted to progressive music. Um, and that, that addiction lasted for years (laughs) and it's back too. That's the thing is it's (laughs) reoccurring. The first time I heard it, I remember being disappointed a little bit by the rest of the album because it's a little bit different speed. Um, but obviously over the years, I grew to love every moment of it. Um, even Moonchild. Uh, yeah, the and song itself is so beautiful. The song itself is beautiful. And um, I just recently had a chance to hear the full performance of that, the full unedited version of that, um, at least the unedited album version of it. And, you know, it, it has this effect of allowing your mind to drift off. And so when that iconic drum part comes in, uh, it, to me, it makes it even more, you know, awe inspiring because you don't expect it. You know, you're, you're drifting off into, you know, somewhere else, some other world. And then when Giles comes in with that fill, you're like, Oh man, there's so much that's been said about this record over the years. And I even did a review of it. There's not much to add to it. But I will say that um, I did have a chance to go back and listen to some of the live versions of this material. And it kind of struck me because I always thought of Epitaph as being like a dirge, like a funeral dirge. But um, when you hear the live versions, it comes off more bluesy, which I find fascinating. And so it's like they took a blues song and, and like the progression is bluesy. Um, they, They took a blues song and slowed it down and in the process sort of created doom music for the first time, because you kind of have to remember that this is 1969 and everybody's full of optimism and hope for the future. Um, basically, um, Manson, Charles Manson hadn't happened yet. That's the moment where, where everything becomes dark when we realize, Oh, wait a minute, LSD isn't going to save the world. Um, and you know, to release something dark and foreboding and, and doomy at this time was completely off the wall. It, nobody else had done anything like that, uh, up until that point, but man, there was a lot of imitators afterward. That's for sure. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, you're right. If this is the first instance of something that's like, you know, like you said, like really doomy and like 
pessimistic, yeah. kind of like apocalyptic in a way. I mean, yeah. also the I mean the lyrics are beautiful, but they are you know like you're in a torture chamber in the the king's court, or you know epitaph has this like it's all oh, epitaph's gorgeous, but it's also it has this imagery of like you know people being like hung on a planet somewhere and like it's like the end of the world kind of thing. You know, the wall on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. It's like yeah. everything's falling apart. You know, it's yeah. it's really special in that way. At least when it came out, it was, you know, a peerless, really. I dearly love this record. It's one of my all time favorites. And, um, you know, we'll we'll get to the ranking. But, um, you know, there's there's only maybe one or two others that I may rank above this. And Me it's too. It's just totally um, personal preference and experience. And I think that this record does a good job um, of setting the tone of what King Crimson in the future would be. A lot of, you know, similar way to maybe the way Frank Zappa and the Mother's Freak Out does. It, it's sort of like the mission statement uh, for the next couple of decades for Frank. You know, Court of the Crimson King is sort of similar because, you know, you have a mixture of styles, you have up-tempo songs, you have a dirgy track, you have, you know, light elfin music, almost like Fairport Convention, um, even though they could be very dark too, with uh, I Talk to the Wind. You also have the improv, and the improv thing is is something that, that's a, a theme that carries through every King Crimson record, almost. Every single one has a little bit of that sort of free improvisation, and it's something that they got better at. There are certain groups of people who are somewhat close to what King Crimson is, but they are only one King Crimson, right? Yeah. And King Crimson is a way of doing things. Um, it could be, you know, it's, it seems to be always Robert Fripp, but also it could be with an, any number of other people, as we're going to find out very soon. Yeah. Um, but it's the way of doing things. It's the the way that the people play music together, and the as Fripp calls it, like the muse of music comes down and you know takes over what's happening with you and becomes something else. That's King Crimson. And right. a lot of times it happens in improvisation. It happens in the band, like fleshing out a composition together. It's a collective thing that becomes the King Crimson. It's not just, yeah. you know, one guy shining down his influences. This guy is a catalyst with other people. Then they together create a King Crimson. And it has a specific quality, which does have stuff that pulls from classical music, a lot of jazz and improv, a lot of bluesy rock, but also together is Crimson. Yeah. You know, and I really like that about them too it's it's not just like it's a band playing this kind of music it's they're playing king crimson because it's what the process is and what the band is doing not yeah. what the band is called there, there's no star there's no front man i mean th there may be somebody who holds a position that is like a front man but you know for the most part the music is the front man mm -hmm. the music is the star everything is meant to be in service and you'll see this uh when we talk about future albums um, where, you know, Fripp imposes a lot of restrictions <laughs> upon yes. what people play, Bill Bruford, uh, <laughs> spoiler, yeah. uh, in order to keep that balance in check. Um, yeah, it, it, this is the beginning of a remarkable, uh, remarkable set of albums. So album number two, In the Wake of Poseidon, um, this is Fripp in Crisis. I mean, we're going to be fripping crisis for a couple of records here, but uh, this is the beginning of the crisis because um, the original King Crimson lineup imploded in America. Mm -hmm. uh, they just they just had enough of it, I think. And part of that is is that uh, this band were incredibly successful very quickly, and I think that you know you'll you'll see that with a couple of future King Crimson lineups that they peak really fast. And then there's also the inevitable like, <laughs> yeah, and decline like, that comes Giles after that. And, Giles and McDonald got tired of touring so much so quick in the states, and they missed home, and they just announced that they were going to leave King Crimson right before the last show at the Fillmore West in uh, yeah. 1969, like December, and then King Crimson ceased to exist essentially right after that. Uh, but they wanted to like Fripp wanted to record an album. So he asked Greg Lake to stay on and Michael Giles to record the album in the studio. And they said, yes, thankfully. And, you know, what we get out of that little nugget of an idea is in the wake of Poseidon. Um, 
Yeah, it also features new a couple of new King Crimson members, or may or may not be members. It's kind of fluid at this point. Like yeah. this goes back to what I said about the way of doing things, right? Because King Crimson really isn't a band at this point, but it's people making King Crimson music. Yeah, uh, it's Tippett yeah. and uh, what is it? Phil Tippett? Yeah, Keith Tippett. Keith Tippett. Phil yeah, Tippett he, was the model was a, guy on uh, Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Keith Tippett. So, <laughs> yeah. In addition to Fripp and Greg Lake and Michael Giles, you have Keith Tippett on pianos, who essentially joined King Crimson at this point. Keith Tippett is also like a, a f- more of a free jazz kind of piano player, which is very yeah. evident in his playing. He also did a few like progressive and, again, Canterbury leaning projects alongside this. So you also have Peter Giles on bass, who comes back just to record this he album. Comes back. Mel- yeah. Yeah. Mel Collins on saxes and flutes, who I think also joins the band at this point. Uh, Gordon Haskell sings one track, who will be more and more important on the next record. And then Peter Sinfield stays as the wordsmith uh, for this album, which came out in early 1970. Some people will say that it's a stylistic copy and paste of the debut, the debut album. And, um, you know, Part of this might be that so much of it was performed by the 1969 King Crimson, um, such as Pictures of a City. Um, Cadence and Cascade is a remake of a Giles and Giles and Fripp track. Yes. The peace theme that comes from the Giles and Giles Fripp sessions. Um, And of course, the Devil's Triangle was performed as Mars. uh, Yeah. By the 1969 King Crimson. And it was terrifying. Yeah. (laughs) It's a Gustav Holst piece that is scary beyond belief. Yeah, it's like but they unreal music on this album. They um, ah, they kind of turned it into a a, a a music concrete piece, and yeah, it's horrifying. But I still think that the staccato rhythm, everybody playing the same thing together, uh, of the 1969 live versions is a little scarier. <laughs> I agree. The album version. It's yeah. just a little bit more ominous. Um, I do think the devil's triangle is be- is a better than its reputation. A lot of people don't like that. Oh, I like I it. I think it's great. I, I think it's like, it's one of those like psychedelic experiments from like the late sixties, early seventies, like interstellar oil drive, which is also very successful, but yeah, you know, I countless other examples from other bands, but um, this is one of the better ones. You know, I think it's very successful at what it does. It like kind of makes you feel like you're lost at sea falling into the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. You know, while you're listening to Gustav Hulst become completely destroyed as the record goes on. And there's that like haunting, like horn, like ship horn sound right in the middle. It's very cool. It's yeah. a really unique experience. There's nothing else quite like that in the Crimson catalog. That's for sure. <laughs> and I, I mentioned this in my comparison video, but my favorite little moment of, uh, of uh, the devil's triangle is when Keith Tippett is doing like the cat food runs across the piano. Oh, I love and, that. Yeah. And you hear a little bit of Greg Lake singing um, the chorus of in the court of the crimson King, and then it immediately gets smashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like with a hammer. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's like, well, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah. I really like, um that leads into like i really like what you say about this album too it's kind of like a it looks a little it's like a transition it really is like a true transition record right because like the first first says too because the first half is you know it isn't the same exactly as the first album but you know pictures of a city is kind of like 21st century schizoid man i also really like pictures of a city and i think the guitar play the parts in that song are way more challenging than the first one um and then you get another ballad and then you get wake up Poseidon, which is a, like a epitaph like song. I think it's different. And I also think it it's is great. different. I'm yeah, very, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that song. It's gorgeous. It slips uh, into my subconscious and yeah. I start thinking about it and it'll just run through my mind. I'm like, Oh, you know, maybe that's better than I initially gave it credit. Yeah, I think it's like maybe a little too long, like one minute too long. But besides sure. that, I think it's amazing. It maybe has Greg Lake's best singing on a studio on a record. In my opinion, God, it's amazing. But after that, you get like the weird stuff, which I think switches into like more lizard territory. Like you get cat food, which is an awesome Mm -hmm. song and a single. The weirdo song, which is half of lizard. The next album is weirdo songs that are successful. The devil's triangle. And then it ends with the acoustic number, the end of peace. There aren't really, I don't think 
any other albums like this in the Crimson catalog because they don't really transition much after the early years. You know, Poseidon is, you know, we're going to get to rankings and subjective stuff later, but it's better than his reputation. A lot of people don't like this one. Yeah. And I disagree. I, th- I think it's a really good record. Honestly, King Crimson, had, except for like maybe two albums, they're all like really amazing. But I, I think this is a really good record. You know, very yeah. underrated. The one that definitely you need to spin more, especially the Wilson mix, because I think Wilson does wonders with this mix, like he does with every Crimson album. I mean, every mix he's yeah. done is is really eye opening. Like this well, is as like we a, pointed out, yeah. um, and this this was before we were on air, so to speak. But um, this is one of the few examples where Wilson shares billing on the with mixes. Fripp. Yeah, with Fripp. Yeah, Fripp is credited uh, on all these mixes. So I, I find that really, really interesting. OK, so um, we three. move on to the third record, the very colorful Lizard album, which uh, I've always had an opinion on this record, apparently. Uh, some <laughs> of you may be able to dig back far enough into the Prague magazine archives and find that I submitted a review of this that was printed. So perhaps uh, through the magic of editing and stagecraft, uh, we shall superimpose my review for five quick seconds so you can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird album. Isn't this it? is uh, one of, I have another one of my favorite album arts. Oh also, yeah. This is probably my second favorite because the first one is timeless, but this is just so cool. I mean, it's the letters King Crimson with all of this, some medieval imagery, some like 1970 imagery. It's, yeah, the it's Beatles. really <laughs> detailed. The Beatles are here. It's so cool. Well, I believe that the cover um, is meant to represent each one of the album's tracks. It does. Uh, it so yeah. Well, yeah. So the the circus, obviously, um, the Beatles are happy family. Um, Lady of the Dancing Water is in under R. So again, uh, Lizard is another shift. This is their second album from 1970. So 1970 is the first year where they released two albums. Uh, this album, again, has very different personnel from Nobody Could Poseidon. We got Robert Fripp again, of course. You got Mel Collins back on, on flute saxes. Gordon Haskell is now the main singer and bass player. You have Andy McCulloch on drums and you have Pete Sinfield on words and pictures. That's the King Crimson band. But mm-hmm. on this album, there's a lot of horns and woodwinds and they are played by Robin Miller, who plays oboe and cor anglais, who is, was one of the principal oboists for the London symphony at the time under Pierre Blaise, which is pretty yeah, incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> um, Mark Sharig on cornet, Nick Evans on trombone, Keith Tippett on piano and all the pianos and a cameo from John Anderson of yes, singing the first movement of the title track, which is amazing. Mark Sharig and Nick Evans are um, pretty big session players in England at the time. They play on a lot of like prog leaning stuff. Several Canterbury albums feature their terrific playing on them as well. Um, and you know, I, so lizard is, Yes, it's a weird album, but it's one that I've always loved. I'm one of those weird people that really likes Lizard. The weird Lizard people. Yeah, there was, this is the, the second album that we've seen so far that has at one time been a favorite of mine. This was a, There was a time in my life where this was my favorite King Crimson album. Mine it's too. still up there. Yeah, I love yeah. it. You know, it's half the album is these like, it's really jazz infused. And I'm a big, if you guys didn't know already, guys and gals didn't know, I am a huge jazz person. Um, and this album is loaded with like free jazz and horns. And I, that's right up my alley. It's like bread and butter for me. Yeah. Um, and it's got that stuff with some tons of Mellotron, real weirdo songs in the first half. And then there's the epic lizard title track with lots of experimental, you know, synthesizers and with the really awesome horn and woodwind improvisations in the second movement that I love the pieces. There's great lyrics um, you know, it's, I would, I was reading in May, you know, a lot of notes for somewhere are saying, someone's saying that this is probably the most experimental King Crimson record. And I think that may be true. Uh, it's just, it was, it was Wilson saying that. And I think he's right. Like there's nothing that sounds like this, you know, it's a really unique and strange album. And I love it for that. To me, it's a, uh, it's a flawed gem to uh yeah. to, to borrow a phrase from uh from Jethro Tull. I feel like the sound of the VSC3 synthesizer 
uh, is a defining characteristic of the first side of this record. Um, yes. where, whereas the woodwinds, you know, Mark Cherig, et cetera, um, are the defining characteristic of side two to me. And, um, the VSC three, I just saw a great, uh, documentary by, um, by rail NYC, um, a, uh, a, a YouTube channel here that I watch pretty often. Um, and he did a documentary on Pink Floyd's obscured by clouds. And he was talking about how they were, they and King Crimson were one of the, you know, couple of the first bands to use the VSC three. And, um, there was quite a learning curve to kind of figure out what the heck does this thing even do? And it was expensive, you know, so I, I can kind of see, you know, this band, you know, dropping a huge sum of money, money on this in 1970 and then being like, well, we're going to use it. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Let's put it all over the album. And uh, there, there's really no other King Crimson synthesizer record to speak of. And that's not really what this is. It's only the first side of it that is, the first half of it. But I think that, that that's what's unique about it, um, is that the use of the synthesizer. And a lot of these sounds are quite, to my ear, pioneering for the time, such as the uh, some of the really dark, foreboding sounds that you hear on Circus, which is one of my favorite, like, oddball King Crimson songs. Um, just in general, I think it's a great opener. Um, oh, but you also too. hear it like on the opening of um, indoor games, you know, that bleep. And yeah. uh, th- there's moments of this record where it almost sounds like everybody's trying to play on top of each other, but it never quite loses its cohesion for me until like maybe the last three minutes of the suite. Um, and this album you know, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and, but it, but it's that last few minutes of the suite. It doesn't quite stick the landing for me. And I think that that's what will forever make this kind of a somewhere in the middle, you know, King Crimson record. It's not their worst by any stretch. Um, but it's got flaws. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not perfect. Some of uh, Robin Miller's uh, oboe playing, especially um, Stellar. in the uh, what is that that part of the suite called? Um, is it the bolero. Yeah, the bolero. Robert Fripp makes a comment that that melody has carried him through some difficult times, and I can agree. I can I can agree with that because this is beautiful. It's heart achingly beautiful. I love Lady of the Dancing Water. It is such a beautiful little song. Uh, something about it is special. It really speaks to me. And like, Happy Family is a song that, like, it's almost like the band is feels sounds like they're falling down the stairs, but it's yeah. controlled. You know, yeah. like, who the heck would release something like that? It is so cool. It's really one of the weirdest songs in the whole catalog. I really like it, but it is really one of the out there numbers. Yeah. I also, I think, want to say I love Circus, too. But I don't think any of the live versions come like from any bands that try to perform it, come close to this version. I don't know. Something about the studio version of this, that really leans into the like menacing creepiness of the circus itself. Yeah. And I don't think the live versions kind of match it. It's almost like tedium live for some reason for me, but in the studio, it's great. And it's maybe one of the only crimson songs that I feel that way about. A lot of times they elevate their material on stage, but maybe not with this song. But that's my take. Why did Gordon Haskell join King Crimson? I think Robert might have asked him to join. He uh, did not have a good time. No. And he even <laughs> commented um, back because because Gordon saw um, some of the early concerts. And he even commented them that then that it wasn't for him, that Doomy stuff wasn't for him. He yeah, was a hippie. he was terrified. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, you, you have him just breaking into laughter at some of this stuff and almost Genuine refusing to laughter. sing it. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But he's got a, he's got a decent voice for this material. So like, I, I get why Robert would want to collaborate with him too, but I just always wondered like, what the heck <laughs> if he yeah, hates it so I mean, much, yeah. why is he there? <laughs> I, think it, I think it works for this album. Like his voice does work for this material for sure. It's hard for me to imagine somebody else singing this like Boz Burrell. I don't think would work for this. And I don't think Greg Lake, well, maybe Greg Lake, but I don't know. I think he, he's a good fit for this oddball of an album. Yeah, and that's Lizard. 
It's a, uh, you know, I love it, but it's real weird. <laughs> so album number four, usually um, most bands, I would say, take three albums and experiment and find their sound. And then by album four, they've arrived. Usually album four is the big one for most bands. Is Islands the big album for King Crimson? Is this where King Crimson arrive? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's very tired. I hear yeah. exhaustion when I listen to this album. And I feel exhaustion when I listen to it. It's it's really spacious. It's so spacious, it's kind of empty. You yeah. know, I think this is the point where I think we're really going to start to you know, I don't know, irk people, but like I know people, some people really love this album and more power to them. But I, I'm not one of those, neither of us are one of those people. Yeah. Um, I used to. I think, yeah. I used to really like it too. I think the band is great. And this is not an accurate portrait of this band. This version of Crimson was pretty awesome on stage. Yeah. Um, they, when they wanted to, they can really let loose. Um, but it's, you know, almost nowhere on this album, unfortunately. You know, I like, I like half the songs. I really like Sailor's Tale and I love the letters. The letters is for me, a very underrated Crimson song. And the, the title track is great, but every single song on here that's performed live was better live than in this album. Yeah. Like for me, yeah. former Terror lady kind of falls apart halfway through. I don't like ladies of the road. I think it's one of the worst Crim King Crimson songs. Um, song of the gulls is, is a nice, like, you know, like early 1800s, classical kind of string quartet which other is nice. giles and giles and it's frip. another giles giles and frip thing wow I didn't so is the letters that. i love the lyrics on islands too but i you know the lyrics and ladies of the road are probably the worst in the whole catalog yep <laughs> as we were saying before this might be the the one where sinfield uh influences you know doesn't work so much for crimson anymore well let me put it this way it's no man with an open heart <laughs> yeah i think my hot take is that the letters is my favorite song um and uh i think that sailor's tale is outstanding within the context of islands but in the broader context of great king crimson workouts it's not my favorite um, and that I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that people are going to really disagree with me on that. Um, and you know, here's the thing is I, I have heard maybe 10 seconds of this band live, um, in recent memory. I, I, I used to have live at the marquee 1971 and I liked that set, but I don't remember anything about it now. Um, so I can only go by the album and there are um, better documents also of that. I'm, band. I'm, I'm sure there are. I mean, I, I've, I heard a little bit of the performance um, I think that you had recommended. Um, and I, I thought that it, yeah, that, that was a lot better, but um, my feeling is that the band were spread too thin um, at this point, creatively and professionally as well. Um, but I think that I remember reading that Robert was like getting two or three hours of sleep a night or something like that. And, you know, he, he was recording, he was playing live and he was writing out parts as he's waking up in the morning and stuff. And his exhaustion shows the band's exhaustion shows. This is the King Crimson that would go out on stage after this album. They, uh, this is the first time they performed live since the original band. And, you know, it's Robert and Mel Collins, but you got Boz Burrell who sings and plays bass and Fripp taught him the bass, which is super interesting. That dude really had a hard job. My goodness. They'll play bass with this group. Um, and then mm. you have Ian Wallace on the drum kit, who's a jazz drummer, but you get the returning of uh, Mark Charig and Robin Miller on this album too. And Keith Tippett. Um, plus you get uh, Paulina Lucas who sings soprano voice and Harry Miller who plays string bass on Foreman Terror Lady which is a really nice color for King Crimson. Honestly, I like it the is. opening with the string bass. It's nothing yeah. quite like that anywhere else in this catalog. And Steven Wilson's mix of this one, uh, repaired, a, a an issue. Like, a it was always like a weird scratch or something on that yeah. opening. And, and like, that's, that's gone. So that's, it's really nice to hear it cleaned up and, and treated so lovingly. But this is one case where, um, I find this album a difficult listen. Like I cannot, actually sit down and listen to it all the way through. Yeah. Um, it's, and there's really only one other King Crimson album that I would say that about. Um, and yeah. we'll get to that a little while later. The only thing to say is that I like the letters 
Um, but I like the Giles and Giles and Fripp versions better. I like the 1969 live versions better, uh, where it's, you know, just titled drop in. It's just too scattered and it just doesn't, doesn't come together. It's like you were, it's like the opposite of happy family where, you know, it's scattered in a good way. This is scattered in a bad way. The letters comes alive. I think when the, the most recent crimson, like the seventh and eight headed monsters, they play the letters. I think it rips at that point. But, you know, it's another example of all the material on here, in our opinion, is not a, nowhere near as good as the live stuff. And I have to admit that um, while listening to Islands and, and suffering through Islands, um, I was thinking, can I do this? <laughs> do, do I want to really listen to all of these studio albums and rank them? Is this even going to be possible or is this going to be a chore? Um, and there, there was this feeling I was kind of disheartened after Islands. And, uh, I mean, you, you were the one who pointed out, well, so is Robert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly how he felt. He, he was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this anymore. Um, and, uh, he knew that change had to happen. Um, and for the first time, um, uh, there was no King Crimson record in 1972. Um, however, he spent 1972, um, rehearsing with a new band. Um, and this would have been with John Wetton on bass, Dave Cross on uh, violin and Mellotron, and two percussionists, Bill Bruford on drums and Jamie Muir on percussion. At this time, John Wetton was a member of Family and Bill Bruford was a member of Yes. Um, and so there was something a little bit, you know, behind the scenes about it, inner workings, schemes, conspiracies about the whole thing. I find it amusing that um, it had to be coordinated so that John Wetton and Bill Bruford both quit their respective bands at the exact same time, <laughs> because even then the news traveled fast uh, among the network of recording studios. Um, and uh, But this was the birth of a whole new King Crimson. Are we going to call it King Crimson? We don't know, but obviously it became King Crimson. The resulting album was their fifth, Mark's Tongues and Aspic. And my, in, in my introduction to Islands, I had asked you, I said, the fourth album is usually where bands arrive. Well, this is where King Crimson arrive for me. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the debut album is classic. It's one of a kind. Um if they had released one album and quit, I still think Court of the Crimson King would be legendary. Um, but here's where King Crimson upped the ante for the first time, in my opinion. And um, this album is completely cinematic. Like, I even, I even think I said in my note, I, I, you know, when it came time to listen to uh, Lark Songs and Aspic, I said, do I want to watch a movie tonight or listen to King Crimson? I really, well, wait a minute. I can do both. I can listen to Lark's Tongues and Aspic because it is cinema. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cinema for your ears. I'm with you. Like this is, you know, I did the same thing you did and Islands kind of, I was like, all right, I'm tired now a little bit too. And I put this on the next night and I, li I, the amount of times that I said, wow, while listening to this <laughs> is telling of how amazing this record is like the first piece lark's tongues part one might be one of the most impressive tour de forces that crimson has ever put on tape or any band really it is yeah. a real masterpiece it's unbelievable the amount of stuff that they're doing with just 13 minutes it's crazy it is so it is like you said so cinematic um you know, I think this is a real masterpiece. Like I, my notes say, holy shit, is this album amazing? Or <laughs> is like, this album it's real? Like, <laughs> it's night and day from islands. Like yeah. there's a massive change. Like there's, well, first of all, this is my favorite period of King Crimson. Like these, this band is my favorite is really special for me. They were just lightning in a bottle, a mass, amazing chemistry with these musicians. Um, but man, this thing is so dynamic. This album, it's got, you know, real, I think this is the birth of heavy metal also, but it also has these beautiful acoustic transcendent moments like Book of Saturday is gorgeous. Exiles has moments that are like pure romantic, dripping romantic classical music. Yeah. It's 
really amazing. And, you know, it's night and day, like I said, from Islands. You know, Islands has some nice stuff, but it's really tired. This is full of life, and it's full of dynamism, and there's a drive behind this band. You can feel it and hear it. Much like the first album in the court, this has a drive to it yeah. that's almost unmatched anywhere else. Only found in the rare special King Crimson record, and I think this is one of those special yes. King Crimson records. It definitely is, yes. And I I like what Fripp said, um, because basically when choosing the personnel for this album, um, he had auditioned Bill Bruford and auditioned Jamie Muir separately, and he realized, well, wait, Bill Bruford is way too straight for this group. You know, he's way too solid. He's way too drummer, typical drummer. Um, and then, you know, but Jamie Muir is way too far out to be to be the drummer. And he he makes a comment, something like um, he he realized w- one morning, wait a minute, I should combine them because the strengths of one will make up for the weakness of the other and, and vice versa. And I think that that's the defining characteristic of this album. And I think the great deceiver says something like Jamie Muir accounted for 60% of this band's presence at that time, because here he is, he's wearing furs and he's got blood capsules and fangs. Does he have (laughs) fangs? I've never seen actual footage of it. We'll we'll just say he He has has like a, a, like a tweedy little mustache going on too. But um, yeah, but dude would like, would climb up the stacks of amps or the, the PA system and crunch down on these blood capsules and have blood flowing from his mouth. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is in the liner notes, David Cross said they had no idea that he was going to do that. And yeah. dance around stage, they went on stage and they were all half like <laughs> trying to play music and half flabbergasted at what he's doing on stage. And it's so it's, funny. It's, it's hilarious. It's, a, um, it's like a Peter Gabriel puts on the dress and the, the Fox mask. Uh, yeah. moment. for for all its eccentricity for all of its um you know cinematic nature and its peaks and valleys it's uh it's light moments it's darkness it's beauty it's horror it's Massive. terror yeah um you know there's some great music here there's some really great music and like you mentioned i'm looking at the song titles and there aren't any um but <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned uh exiles like that's the only song on this one that to my ear could have been on court or in the wake of Poseidon that could have been on any of the first four records um, because it has that um, acoustic timbre. And there's even a little bit of flute. I think it's David Cross uh, playing flute yeah. on that track. Um, and I think when I mentioned earlier that you don't hear that timbre much, I think this might be one of the last times you really hear that um, acoustic guitar and flute timbre together. Um, but like easy money oh, yeah. is an incredible piece of music. And you know, when like when people wax poetic about Sailor's Tale, I always have this one in the back of my mind because, I mean, this is this is Fripp as a soloist really stretching out in a way that maybe he hadn't since the, all the way back on the first record um, with 21st Century Schizoid Man. Um, you really hear him, his soloing begin to stretch out in space and it's almost like a Zappa type thing or it's just like a slow groove with just a couple of chords, but it really allows for a lot of growth. And like you said, di- dynamism, di- dynamism, dynamism, dynamism. Yeah. Yeah. Dynamism. Um, it's a, he's an amazing soloist on this. Like this, you're right. Like this is the point where his guitar playing, I think really starts to become absolutely incredible. Like yeah. with, with that piece in particular too, like this crimson, when they play that live, it would be a show stopping improvisation almost every night in yeah. the middle of easy money. And like Fripp unleashing or like, just the band playing together. Sometimes it would be not just a grip solo. It would be the band improvising all four of them at the same time, doing something completely new. And it's always fire. I think that the all time classic on this album is uh Lark songs and aspect part two, um, which is, I mean, for me, that's the best King Crimson instrumental hands down. It's quintessential Crimson, the best all time King Crimson instrumental. Um, and there, there's a moment in this track where it just pairs down to basically Fripp and, and John Wetton together. And what I see in my head is Boris Karloff's Frankenstein, just kind of lumbering, you know, the, <laughs> you know, the old monster movie 
visuals in my mind and and it's it's great you know it's cinema it's like i said it, 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 it's yeah, cinema it's um, cinema. not not much more to say about this one other than um this is the beginning of the gamelon influences and um it goes away pretty rapidly and then it comes back yes um, in a huge way uh later on down the road i think it's a masterpiece like i said before this album is really amazing like this is you know bursting this band bursting into life it just works so well as an album this is how people should make albums like this is a quintessential you know the best produced albums of all time this has got to be one of them and and pacing the pacing yeah it's it's the pacing it's the flow it's the contrast and release it's the the power of the band the strength and material it's all here the boxes are checked following um lark's tongues and aspic um jamie muir left and uh as robert says this is not a man who could be in a group for very long because he's a very free thinker. He's, um, you know, very much into spiritual matters. And, uh, I think he went away and became a monk. He did. This is the first time this happens, uh, yes. that someone leaves King Crimson and becomes a monk for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, the album is starless and Bible black. And I think that, um, this is the, emergence of the flying brick wall after the advent of lark's tongues the band went on the road and the band essentially stayed on the road until it stopped um but while they were on the road they you know they were hurting for tunes so bruford (laughs) um you know and a few other other guys most notably bruford was like come on we gotta we gotta get some tunes going here so he kind of pushed robert to really write robert went in and uh, wrote a couple of tunes and the band kind of collaborated on a couple things, uh, most notably the showstopper fracture. So they like, wrote a couple of tunes, but they, you know, were still missing stuff. And a few weeks before they went into the studio, they played a couple of, you know, professionally recorded concerts in Zurich and in um, Amsterdam and also um, in the Glasgow, uh, the Apollo theater in Glasgow, UK, but they decided to use oh, this cream crimson, was doing something that, well, all the King Crimson's improvise, right? But this King Crimson was doing something special when they improvise. This is yeah. like, for me, there's two things as this group does. They are, for me, the best quartet to play rock music or rock adjacent music. It isn't really rock, right? It's something yeah. different. It's kind but, of like Miles Davis. Yeah, exactly. It has like, it's rock. on that level of, yeah. you know, musicians that are listening to each other and they're, you know, playing off each other. They had like this magic chemistry. I don't know what the heck or how to really describe it properly, but when they were on stage and they were improvising, they were listening and they were, you know, creating something impressive every night that was completely different every night. Even with the songs they were playing, you know, it's very evident when you go to, if you were to follow these guys that they were playing the same songs, but they were playing them so different that it almost sounded like they had new material every single night. It's amazing. Um, with the, so which leads me to two things. One is I have this box set, and <laughs> which is uh, the Starless set, uh, which has really opened my eyes the past. I bought this a year ago, um, just about, and it's really been a year of diving into this material and falling back in love with the band King Crimson itself. Um, this is a treasure trove, by the way. Um, but the from the especially the Amsterdam concert and a little bit from the other ones, they pulled some improvisations to fill out an album. Uh, more or less. And these improvisations are so cool and so unique that they are essentially songs and compositions, right? It's instant, yeah. like Frank Zappa viewed guitar soloing as instant composition. This is much of the same philosophy. Um, so you get Starless and Bible Black, which is half in the studio, maybe a little less than half in the studio. And then the rest is recorded live material, yeah. which is impro- improvised material. I think only the great deceiver is a studio recording. Lament right? is also. And Lament is, yeah. yeah it's just so the first two songs. Yeah, and then there's Chris, overdubs. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of overdubs. Yeah. yeah. So only the beginning of the Night Watch, I think, is in the studio. Or it's the other way around. I forget which. Because yeah. there was some sort of tape problem. Um, and then Fracture was recorded live also, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. That's. Um, yeah, that's, that's from, Amsterdam. Yeah, that's Amsterdam. Yep. Yeah. That's the Night Watch CD. Yeah, and you know, Fracture is like lauded by almost 
anyone who plays guitar is like one of the most difficult pieces of music ever. Yeah. A- Anthony Garone has yep. made an entire YouTube channel and written a book uh, yeah. from he, trying to play Fracture. <laughs> last week, he released a video. He's going to play Fracture live at a King Crimson bass festival in Europe in Wonderful. September. Yeah. Wonderful. Good for him. More power to him. <laughs> He's great. I really yeah. enjoy his uh, his content. Um, but yeah, so Star Wars Survivor Black is an album. I Obviously, I really like it, right? But it's an album that really gets better and better every time I hear it. Um, you know, I tend to – this era of the band, I tend to gravitate now towards listening to live stuff more than the studio albums. Sure. But the albums are impressive as hell. Yeah. And this is no exception. I think um, the title track is one of the sickest things ever played on stage. It is, it is amazing. It's just super cool. And, it, you know, if you didn't know any better, it would sound like it was a piece of music composed in the studio. Yeah. But they played it live on stage, and then it was gone. That's the evil King Crimson. Yeah, it's villain. The evil side. Yeah, yeah it's a, a pure menace. And then there's on the other side of the album, the first side, there's Trio, which is a, another improvisational piece, but it's essentially just violin and acoustic sounds. It's and beautiful. Bill Bruford. Bill Bruford chose not to play and received yeah. a writing credit for it. <laughs> yeah, I listen. It's a choice to not put, you know, not not to play is a choice. Yeah. You know, he was right in this case. The drums wouldn't work here. It's gorgeous. King Crimson has always been split evenly among the members of the band. So by giving Bill Bruford a writing credit, he's being paid publishing uh, for this song he didn't play on. And that's to me, that's Robert's way of thanking him for decades. Yes. <laughs> for his here choices. you go. The Night Watch is... My actually a real strong contender for my favorite King Crimson song. It's up I there. just absolutely love this piece of music. And every, every concert on this box set that I have that I watched for me is like completely mesmerizing. Like it's like what Exiles does in its romantic drippiness. It's about Rembrandt's um The Night Watch. The hmm. but which by the way, I've seen in person, it's in Amsterdam. That painting is extraordinary because it is like you know, 20, 30 feet long. Like it covers a whole hallway. It's breathtaking. Um, but this piece is just so beautiful. And then Fripp always plays a miraculously beautiful guitar solo. Like Fripp is really like, his, I, know, I think his lyricism is always understated. He's an incredibly lyrical guitar player. Oh, yeah. And it shines here. And I love it to pieces. Um, this is a good one, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Getting, I'm getting very objective, but that's okay. <laughs> I like how there, there's a story that John Wetton did not like Fripp solo in The Night Watch. And Fripp was like, uh, I I think you should listen to it <laughs> more carefully or something <laughs> like something like really, you know, like 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 too bad. <laughs> yeah, like, like response about it. <laughs> that's hilarious. Because <laughs> Robert's really proud of it, and, and so he should be. My feelings on this album... Um, have have always been a little bit complicated um, because when I first heard it, I didn't get it. Um, and uh, I actually, if you want to talk about a, uh, a strange duo um, for Easter um, back when I was gifted things for Easter and I was like still in high school, um, I was gifted this album and lizard at the same time. And I remember listening to lizard all the way through. And I connected with it because uh, we're both band kids, right? So horns and brass and that kind of stuff might be more easy for us to relate to uh, than other rock music fans, potentially. Um, So I related to Lizard really quickly, um, kind of as a flute player and and being interested in in symphonic and wind music. Um, But I didn't really get the improvs at first. And I, I just remember falling asleep um, through the title track. And um, when Fripp comes on with, cause that's double tracked when he, when he comes in at the end of fracture uh, with the double track guitars, I remember that scaring the lights out of me and, and like I jolted awake. Um, but uh, you know, that's, Still, when I listen to it, I find that such a powerful moment. And, you know, the years um, over the years, I have grown to really like this album. 
Um, and I've grown to appreciate a lot of like the lyricism, like you said, of songs like the night watch. Um, and one evening I sat down and listened to the Zurich concert from 1973 that's included here. Um, and I liked that well enough that I bought the, um, the great deceiver box set, which I should show, but we're not talking about, uh, great deceiver, but that, that came yesterday. So I'm still listening to it. So basically this is a period of King Crimson that I'm still exploring and um, learning to appreciate. Um, but I do really like it. I, however, would consider Starless and Bible Black to be my least favorite of the 70s trilogy. It's a great record, and it's one that's growing on me. And I will say that in the course of doing this ranking video, this one bumped up several notches. Um, oh, yeah. Because I listened to it in context, and then I went back and, and listened to it again, and I liked it even more. If I get a chance to, I'm going to buy the box set because – uh, I would love to get. I would love to dig into these shows um, and and hear more of what you're talking about. Definitely need to. It covers almost the entire. Well, I'll say two things. It covers the almost the entire European tour around when this album came out and afterwards, and almost all of the concerts are in. They're called the blue tapes. They're like it's like soundboard recordings essentially, and they're lauded for the sound quality and they sound great. Almost all of our concerts here, except for the one bootleg concert are amazing sound quality. Yeah. I think they're multi-track. They are mostly multi-track multi recordings. Um, yeah. So the, like the first six discs, I think are like straight off the soundboard and the rest are multi-track recordings and they're great yeah. multi-track recordings. I, I would love to get my hands on a copy of that set. Yeah. At some point. They and, sound amazing. <laughs> like really amazing. But I also have this feeling that they're eventually going to do, um, a 50th anniversary edition of that. Um, they did large tongues and aspect, last year and they already announced red. I was hoping they would announce starless this year. Um, it is the 50 this year. Yeah, but it's the 50th of red as well. And I think that red is, um, perhaps the better seller. Yeah, um, I think it is too. And that's, uh, that's a, a good segue. It's a good honestly. segue. <laughs> so David so, cross, uh, leaves, right? Yeah. So what happens is the band finishes the Europe tour and set in early 74, like around March, and then they go to the U S and then they play throughout the States. And right towards the end of that tour, David Cross leaves. I think part of it is the, you know, the music is starting to get even heavier. Um, like this is really like where somewhere the proto metal comes in wet in and Bruford really want to up the ante on the heaviness and cross. That's, feel that's the flying brick wall that I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, you're right. That's the rhythm that's section. Where that comes back the rhythm section, the flying yeah. brick wall is really starting to push the envelope, which is amazing, but it's, you know, cross it's drowning him out. It's, it's drowning, drowning out him cross. out. And cross felt that his uh, violin was being undershadowed and he was essentially just a keyboard player. Well, which he may was, or may um, not be true, but you know, he decided to leave the band because of those reasons. Well, cross was, was hired mostly um, as a compliment to Jamie Muir. Right. Uh, according to the great deceiver liner notes. Um, so I guess with Jamie Muir out of the group, there was less space for violin and right, you know, Fripp's guitar is one of the things that was beginning to drown out, um, yeah. the violin. Now I like what David Cross brings on keyboards and there's a lot of his keyboard stuff that you hear on like the night watch, um, versions that aren't on oh, the starless and Bible black album. His violin playing like does like it's. I think the difference comes in the the America tour, really, because on the Starless shows, like Cross does have some killer violin moments, and there are several improvs that are kind of like trio, you know, like it's just like a very quiet kind of moody thing, or like Cross will play yeah. a solo in Exiles or Lark's Ones, and it's like, you know, amazing stuff, really. Yeah. So you have King Crimson distilled to a trio uh, of John Wetton, Bill Bruford, and Robert Fripp. But uh, to augment this trio, we do have contributions from David Cross, of course. Uh, he appears on Providence. So you, you have a trio augmented by some familiar names. Yeah. Um, David, uh, Mel Collins, soprano saxophone, Ian McDonald, alto saxophone, Robin Miller, oboe, and Mark Cherig, cornet. So I feel like there must have been something in the air that made Fripp realize that this band was on borrowed time. Um, and I wonder if there was an attempt to, um, tie together 
some of the early King Crimson influences because Fripp left the music industry after <laughs> this album um, for, for a while. And I think that it's possible he was thinking, well, you know, this is the last King Crimson album. This is going to be the last one. You know, so I, I, I do feel like there was a there, there's like a tying together of the loose ends happening with this album. And, you know, I really think that there there is not a bad track on this album. No. Um, and I could wax poetically about all of them, but there's nothing like Starless. Starless is in the court of the Crimson King up a couple notches. Um, and I mean the title track of, of in the court of the crimson. Yeah. King. It's, it's a dark and brooding multi-part, uh, epic, um, that kind of encapsulates everything that King Crimson were, were about up until that point. Um, and Stephen Wilson says it's the ultimate progressive rock song and who am I to disagree? I mean, I know that, that, is King Crimson Prague? Is it not Prague? That's a debate for the ages, but we can at least agree that um, they did have their moments and that's definitely one of their, their progressive moments. But um, yeah, this is, this is a great album and it's one of my absolute favorite albums by anybody. I've been re-listening to Crimson a lot the past year, but this is an album I haven't heard in a really long time. I don't know why, but I just have not heard red in like, Oh, it's got to be like six plus years, believe it or not. Um, but last week I spun it again for the first time and I was pretty wowed. Um, I, there, I, this is another album where this is my favorite record of all time at one point, um, which again speaks a lot about this album. It's amazing. It really is amazing. You know, it's essentially a, a power trio for half for most of the album. And like on yeah. paper, that could sound really thin maybe or like you get tired of it. But this record is humongous. It's just this massive sound and it hits you like a truck immediately with red. Yeah. You know, it's like that's red for me again is a song that I think works best on the album. I like red as an instrumental, but I, I for, for some reason live, it's doesn't work as well for me, but on the studio, it's amazing. Um, and I also love fallen angels. One of my favorite ballads in the catalog. One more red nightmare is a favorite of mine too. I absolutely adore that song. Um, I remember when I saw Crimson for the second time in 2014, they played that and I flipped out because I never thought I would hear that song live, let alone by, you know, King Crimson itself. That was a big shock. Um, I love Providence. Also, this listen, uh, I actually spun the album again the next night too. The Pro Providence really knocked me out. I think I'm like ready for it. It's like I always kind of liked Providence, but I, like when I was younger, it kind of just like went over my head a bit. But after listening to so much of this band improvising, Providence slaps. Providence is incredible. Like yeah. this, you know, a little spoiler for my ranking. I probably would rate this higher than in the court simply because the Providence improv is so damn hot compared to the compared um, to Moonchild. Moonchild improv, which is so it's not. naive. It's, it's naive. naive. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, the word. I Absolutely. Use. That's a great word. It's a very naive improv. But Providence is really um, I like what you said about it. It's very like Penderecki. Almost. It's really mm -hmm. like avant-garde classical music, but in a rock setting. And you get um, John Wetton's absolutely evil bass sound. Like His bass is gnarly. Um, and I love that very much. And Starless, too. It's funny. All the live versions, the lyrics were never figured out. After hearing so many live versions, it was so nice to hear the actual lyrics of this song. Like, <laughs> fully formed and proper you know, Wetton's not repeating the same verse over and over again, which is kind of like, all right, I get it. But, you know, that's just because you hear it so much. That's Starless is a masterpiece of, of music. You know, it's not really much to say it besides that. It's a bona fide masterpiece. Nothing else quite like Starless. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good capstone to what could have been all of King Crimson. So after this, um, Robert Fripp is sick of the music industry and he goes and joins a monastery for a while. He gets away from the music business and he finds his inner peace. He's probably meditating a lot and just kind of soaking in his experience and figuring out what's next. Um, and in the late seventies, he moves to New York. He, he leaves the monastery, moves to New York. Suddenly he's getting a call from David Bowie and Brian Eno 
and he's appearing on the Heroes record. Um, he's producing Peter Gabriel too. He's producing Daryl Hall uh, in the Sacred Songs record. Um, he's involved with Debbie Harry as a musician and otherwise. Uh, I think briefly. Um, they th- here's what I learned today is they nearly starred in a remake of Jean Luc Godard's Alphaville, oh which is God. one of my favorite films. Uh, but there was nearly a version with Debbie Harry and, and Robert Fripp as the lead characters. So this is a time, the seven years, uh, the seven year gap um, between King Crimson records is a time for exploration and discovery. And, you know, Robert is jumping in with both of his feet into a new experience and, you know, learning from the new wave. You know, he's going out and seeing the Ramones live and, and, doing something completely different than what you'd expect. Um, and in this time he makes exposure, which we won't be ranking. Um, but I just wanted to mention that that's one of my favorite Robert Fripp albums. Um, and it, it is at an interesting point in the King Crimson Canon to me, because it is kind of the bridge between discipline and red. Um, but, um, he, he calls this the, the drive to 1981, um, and there's one band there, the league of gentlemen that comes back, uh, with a new lineup, a new mission statement. Um, and, uh, aside from doing some Frippertronics, which is, um, a, a playback of loops that he solos over top of, um, he's not really involved as the band leader, but slowly, uh, Fripp begins to realize, oh wait, I'm back in the music business after all it crept up on me. Um, and, uh, this leads to the formation of the 1980s King Crimson lineup, um, with Adrian Ballou, Bill Bruford comes back, uh, and Tony Levin on bass. Um, Robert Fripp said that Tony Levin is the best bass player he's ever worked with. Sorry, John. Sorry, Greg. Uh, Tony Levin is top of the heap and they, they, uh, auditioned many bass players, but um, from what I understand, Tony Levin was the one that they didn't have to explain anything to. He was just able to figure it out on his own. They knew he was the guy. He was the one to work with. So initially, the group is called Discipline. Um, and uh, there's a lot of pressure, uh, partially from the record company, but also from a lot of Robert's friends, um, probably most notably uh, Brian Ferry of the band Roxy music was saying, Hey Robert, why don't you call that thing King Crimson? Isn't this kind of King Crimson? Um, and, uh, it, it was a case of where Fripp wanted to get discipline on the road and to test it in front of an audience. And following that show at the moles club, I think he fully embraced, um, you know, the, the, that this is King Crimson and, uh, suddenly their earnings doubled (laughs) because there's this, (laughs) there's this name recognition and the power of rain, rain name recognition. And there's so much interest in the band and there's a bit of a, a zeitgeist happening. That's similar to 1969 King Crimson. So the resulting album is discipline. And I don't have a single copy of discipline. I got, two. I have the box set. <laughs> Mike's got two. I'm going to be kind of holding up the box set and just talking about the eighties albums in general. Discipline is never an end in itself, only a means to an end. It's <laughs> the a quote on the back of the album, which is great. Um, discipline rules. Uh, this discipline is yet another Crimson album that was a favorite of my number one at one point. Um, shows how much I love the band, I guess, and how that I keep flip flopping these damn things in my life. Um, Discipline's great. Uh, I, you know, it really is one of those albums that kind of changed music again. Like they're like, and also not just like the crimson sound, but discipline changed music in general. It's like there's a way more of a world music, quote unquote, influence. Not a great term, world music, but there's a lot of gamelan influence. There's a lot of African music influence, and the big thing that they did was inter like add interlocking guitar parts between Adrian and Robert Fripp, and that stuff is really it's new, it's exciting, it's something completely different. And it's fantastic. Plus, you have Bill Bruford and Tony Levin behind them, which is a monstrous rhythm section. Um, and like the four of them really did create something brand new with this album and with 
the eighties crimson in general is a rather special time for sure. Um, I think as a subjective, right? No objective. I think my brain stopped working for a minute. <laughs> Let me try again. For me, in my personal life, I might have played discipline too much because it's uh, it went down a bit in my ranking, as I'll show you later, everybody. But um, I do still love it. It's just I now I like a little other ones better. I think it's a masterpiece. What really I gravitate to most is Mate Kurasai, which is the best Crimson Ballad. It is a drop dead gorgeous song. The Sheltering Sky which is oh, yeah. very it's improvisational based and it's gorgeous. And the title track, the title track is one of those rare songs that every time you listen to it, you find something new. I kind of get lost in it. It really like, look at this, the inner not discipline. The song is this for me. It's like a mm-hmm. constant like weaving of stuff. And the, the way that they made that through only music is something really special. Like how on earth did they do that? It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, this this to me is the one King Crimson album that sounds like it could have been made tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's totally timeless. And um, it doesn't sound like it's 40 years old to me. Um, it, In fact, I think that it's it's aged better than some of the later King Crimson records have. I love this album. Um, and you can tell from my shirt, Maybe it's kind of a spoiler as to where my ranking might end up. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is an all killer, no filler album. It To me, it's, it's King Crimson developing a new vocabulary, a vocabulary that's entirely their own. And it's entirely in the um, what, what we were talking about, the mission statement of everyone is in service of the music. The music is the front person. Um I think that, that that is very much exemplified by the Discipline record, especially that mission statement. Um, talking about favorite songs, uh, I think that Frame by Frame is hard to beat. Um, if I was going to pick a song for my King Crimson compilation from this album, it would be hard to pick one over that one. Um, I mean, Elephant Talk is, um, you know, what, what can be said about Elephant Talk? Um, it's instantly recognizable. Um, there's something about Adrian Ballou's delivery of the lyrics that it's just, it just grabs me. Like it, it grabs my attention, but then the music has this like calming effect on my brain. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's like this, this meditative effect. And, you know, you hear this, especially on the last two tracks, the sheltering sky and, and discipline, but no, there, there's nothing on this album that I don't like. I mean, if I, if I were going to point to something, maybe Thela Hun Jinjit is my least favorite song. Me too. Um, but, you know, I love the abandon of Indiscipline. And I think of all of King Crimson's lyrics, the I repeat myself under, when under stress lyric is the one that comes through my mind absolutely the most. Before any other song, um, I probably think of that one. Um, so... Yeah, th- this is this is peak to me. Um, and one thing that I would say, I mean, we'll get to the ranking, but one thing that this album has maybe that I like about it over some of the others is that I can't just play Lark's Tongues and Aspic and go for a drive. I can't just play Court of the Crimson King and, you know, clean the house or something. When I listen to these records, I need to sit down and absorb them and let them wash over me and have an experience with them. Um, And I'm not saying that discipline doesn't contain that as well, but there's an air about discipline that maybe this is why you burned out on it. It's because it's, it's replayable. You can just listen to it again and again and again, and you can, you can tune in and listen to it closely and get one level out of it, or you can kind of put it on the background and it's still enjoyable, or you can go for a drive with it and it's still enjoyable. And there's not many King Crimson records that go down quite that well for me. Um, so this is, this is an undisputed favorite for me. This is a stable uh, lineup. And yes, uh, this let is me interject stable. Yeah, real quick and say that <laughs> the reason for that is because Robert Fripp had a plan you know, this, this amount of albums and this amount of time, we're going to take six months on six months off and three, in three month intervals. So 
this was right. all like, let's stick to this lineup and make three records. This is the the stable lineup era for King Crimson. You know, the only the one, only one in the entire existence of the band, which is pretty nuts if you think about it. Um, yeah. So they made after Discipline, King Crimson hit the road and then they were off for six months and they recorded another album. Um, and this album is the one called Beat. Um, in my opinion, this album is probably the most underrated in the whole catalog. I think this album's great. On this album, they took all of the interlocking complexity of the first album of this band, Discipline, and they added even more pop sensibility with it. It's a perfect marriage, I think, of pop tunes and complex, in-your-face music. Um, it's great. It also sounds really good. The production on this album is fantastic. Uh, it's one that I think I like more and more every time I listen to it. Um, you know, and it has Waiting Man, which is I, one time I still might be my favorite King Crimson song, period. I love Waiting Man. Just something about it, just like, you know, it's arresting for me. That groove is just the best thing ever. Um, and I love I love everything on this album pretty much, really. Uh, Heartbeat is a great song. Some people hate that song, but I think it's a perfect pop song. It's terrific. Um, and yeah, you know, this stuff fits well in the King Crimson canon. You know, it's not out of line to have some pop tunes in there. Oh, it fits well. Goodness, no. it's, yeah, it's it fits. I mean, I Talk to the Wind is a pop song. Yeah, exactly. Um, you Half know, of Giles not, and Giles and Fripp is, 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 is pop, pop tunes. music. Yeah. yeah. It's been in the DNA forever. You know, Waiting Man is probably my favorite King Crimson song. There's just something about it. I love the pieces. It's just that groove is arresting. It's really a beautiful piece of music. Um, I really like Heartbeat. It's a great pop song. Neil Jack and Me is a fun opener. I really also like Two Hands, The Howler, and Requiem. Especially Requiem, the long version. Because uh, Bruford does some really unbelievable stuff in that too. Oh, yeah. That's um, an example of what is known as applied Frippertronics. Yeah. Is that, that's an improv, um, a Frippertronics loop that was from like 77, 79, somewhere in there. Yeah. He, he played back and they, they improvised around. That's where the tension really started to happen within this band, within interpersonally. Um, with at one point, Adrian Ballou asking Robert to leave. My God. And he disappeared for like three days and, uh, you know, they, they were finally able to coax him back, uh, like, like a shy cat. But, um, it was like the first, this album was the first rift within the eighties King Crimson. This is where the, the cracks within the relationships, uh, started to form. But, um, the thing is, I don't think it shows within the material that much. No. Um, and you really can't tell. And there is something to be said that, you know, for the, the more turbulent King Crimson is behind the scenes, sometimes that makes the music better. Not always, but sometimes it has a positive effect. But I was going to point to the song Neil and Jack and Me as uh, a song that never leaves my brain. What is it? St- Strange Spaghetti in the Silent City or yeah. whatever it is. The, the, the beat poet references are great. It's like oh, an homage yeah. to Jack Kerouac and all those guys. Yeah, and it, it's it's like... And it's also like a, a, a cultural shift for King Crimson because, you know, they're, they're obviously very British, at least historically are. But, you know, at this point in the band, we have two Americans. So, you know, for Adrian Ballou to be singing about Studebakers and all these, you know, very American iconic imagery, uh, it fits. It fits this era of the band really well. And um, I, I love this album. Um, it, it's not my favorite album of the eighties. In fact, it might be, you know, it's always between this one and three of a perfect pair because they're, they're similar. Like this one and three of a perfect, perfect pair are both an attempt at a shaky marriage of the straightforward pop writing that Adrian Ballou uh, brought to the band and, um, the experimentation, the, the weird stuff. Cause neurotica is insane. Neurotica is awesome. Yeah. That's a crazy, insane piece. And I also love The Howler. Um, yeah. that, that's another track that I think is is the return of the the menacing King Crimson. Um, Sartorian Tangier is one of the band's best instrumentals um, with Tony Levin's stick playing really at the forefront of this track. 
like you, I also adore Waiting Man, um, particularly the live versions that just kind of yeah. unfold. Um, there's something that whenever this band plays, it captivates me. And I cannot, like, like if I'm watching them, I can't look away. They just, and, and before I know it, a whole hour has passed. And I'm still watching this performance unfold. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's magic, there's magic in beat. So three of a perfect pair. This is the, the final effort, uh, of the eighties trilogy. And its title is a reflection of that, that little, those three albums, they're three of a perfect pair. It's a description of those, those three albums, uh, as a piece, which I really like, but, um, you know, there, there's also this dysfunctional relationship theme that runs through that track that could also be describing um, what King Crimson were getting themselves into. Although I think that the mood within the band was a little bit better following the beat tour. Um, Robert and Adrian had kind of patched things up and things were, were rather smooth in that regard. Um, but yeah, the three of a perfect pair album. Um, this is again, one of my favorites. Um, there are so many great songs on this album and um, great King Crimson moments. And it's also one of those um, kind of classic uneven King Crimson records in the style of Lizard. Um, it's not perfect, but songs like Man with an Open Heart are phenomenal and absolutely stand up to uh, the level of a waiting man. Um, Model Man is a great track. Sleepless finds King Crimson experimenting with dance beats and dance music, which is something completely new, but it's also dark and foreboding and uh, is kind of based around Adrian's bad dreams. He was having a lot of nightmares during the making of this record. It's got Tony Levin's distinctive bass guitar part right up at the forefront, um, uh, making it an all-time classic. I love, um, what is it, Nuages? That which yeah, passes, Nuages. passes like clouds. It's a nice little... Um, almost David Bowie-esque um, Berlin album. Um, it's kind of a setup of the right side, the side two where things get a little bit more hairy. Um, industry uh, is almost like Mars of the 80s for me because it's kind of based around that, that, that one beat or even look, kind of like a bolero form. Um, that's always been one of my favorites. Uh, Dig Me is really cool. No Warning is okay, but, you know, we we round out with Lark's Tongues and Ass Pick Part 3, which is another worthy. It's not necessarily as good as Part 2, but it certainly is worthy of the name Lark's Tongues and Ass Pick. I think this is a great album, but what holds this back for me a little bit is the performance. I feel like of the three 80s records, this is the one um, that is most benefited in the live concert setting. Uh, particularly Japan 1984 and Absent Lovers. I think this material really shines live. So, Mike, what's your thoughts on Three of a Perfect Pair? Uh, this album was one I used to really love also. Um, now I'm a little less hot on it. Um, I do think it's great. I just don't think it's as good as a lot of the other stuff. I think I'm with you with the performance um, aspect of this record for sure because it just sounds a little like flatter. Yeah. Than the other two albums, and like you said, everything shines live. Like whenever they put out a song from this album live, it was hot, like really hot. Uh, I wish kind of some of that translated into the record, because like sometimes this record sounds just cold to me on re-listen, and I don't quite yeah. know why that is. It's just kind well, of cold. Um, they worked with a different engineer on this one. This wasn't Rhett Davies. Yeah, um, and I think also the fact that they spent a year on it. Maybe that a had long an effect. Time. Yeah, it's like really arduous to make this thing. Um, I will say, though, some of my favorite Crimson material is on this record. Like the title track is an incredible piece title of music. Track's great. It's one of yeah. the best songs in the whole catalog. I love Model Man also. Model Man is, I think, one of the most underrated King Crimson songs. It's just fantastic. Um, and Industry and Dig Me are my other two highlights from this album. The, especially live, those things ripped. Like, in, you know, they work as a really good pair. Like, Industry is like this, like, kind of like a foreboding building up instrumental with a really great, uh, like, vamp on the drums and bass through most of it. Uh, and then it gets crazy into Dig Me, which is a song about a car in a junkyard. 
and it's awesome. It's just from, really twisted. from the car's point of view. <laughs> yeah, it's from the car's point of view, which is so cool. You know, it's this really twisted, demented song, and then it has this this chorus to me is like you know all of a sudden the sun is shining out it's just gorgeous piece of pop music out of nowhere and then it goes back into dementedness i think it's a really tremendous song you know if you want to talk about underrated crimson that's that's the stuff right there oh yeah um and i like lark's tongues three also that one is a grower for me because i I like i used to be just kind of okay about it but now on re-listen i was actually really gross into it i was like oh this is terrific um and i actually heard a lot of you know, it's like a good bridge. Like it is the middle, more or less like a middle movement. Cause like you hear a lot of the part two, you also hear a lot of part four, which comes later on in the catalog. And so it serves as a good bridge for the Lark's Tongue series. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a good album. I just think um, there are a lot of better ones in the catalog for me anyway. For me, this is another one of the cinematic ones. Um, like I would, I would put it in the same categories, Lark songs and aspic, or even the court of the crimson King, uh, album. It, it's an album that is an experience. Yeah. It's a movie. It's a movie for your ears album. And I would say of the three eighties albums, it might be the only one that I would describe that way. Um, I, it's always like between this one and beat, I think beat might have it just for the performance and maybe the songs are a little fresher on beat. Um, but there's something well-rounded to me about three of a perfect pair, uh, that maybe beat doesn't quite have. Um, so I, I'm really a big fan of this album. I think this was a strong end to the eighties trilogy. And, uh, this is actually my favorite King Crimson band, the, the, the quartet. Um, so, uh, this one, these, these three albums coupled with, um, the absent lovers, uh, album, which I think was released in 1998, um, uh, those, those are, are some of my favorite King Crimson records. It's time to get thracked between 1984 and when's the next one. This one's 95, but the, 95. the band came back in 94. So 10 uh, years. Yeah. Robert had the, the seed to bring Crimson back as far back as like 91, I think, or 90, but the way to do it came a little later, but he I had, think he was battling with EG. Yeah, the, the, early the 90s. main thing was the the lawsuit with EG. Yeah, um, you know they kind of went the south way. We don't we'll get the details, but but that had the unintended consequence, I think, of him starting to reach out to these musicians that he used to play with, and that they were starting to become sympathetic toward one another again and on yes. good terms. And I think that that. The, the unintended consequence of this this epic battle with legal battle with EG records was that King Crimson were talking again and there was interest in a new group. And, uh, you know, Robert had the idea to do something of a I forget exactly what the germ was to this idea, but they decided to do like a double duo format. I'm sorry, the double trio format, double trio. double trio. So two guitars, two basses and two drums. And that's the band, a six piece. The sextet. Yeah. Um, so the band, um, which, you know, is Robert Fripp, of course, Adrian Blue on the other guitar. You got Tony Levin on bass and Chapman Stick. And you got uh, Trey Gunn on war guitar, which is like a bass. And a Chapman Stick had like a baby. It's a really diverse and new instrument. It's very cool. Um, and then you get uh, Bill Bruford and Pat Mastelato on the drums. Um and the band got together in 94. I think they started doing rehearsals first and then King Crimson returned to the earth again in Argentina in 1994 um, with a, a first series of concerts there and a EP released called Vroom. And then from there, they went to record a proper album and which is called Thrak. And Thrak is the sound of a hundred guitars going at once. It's a Thrak. <laughs> Um, the really nice uh, industrial album cover also. Yeah. It fits the, the fits the music quite well, I think also. Um, Thrack was one that funnily enough was a real favorite. Again, another one that was a real favorite of mine, but funnily enough plummeted down the rankings this time. Same here. Yeah. I, uh, was, uh, probably the biggest surprise for me was how much I was not vibing with the Thrack. This yeah. Time disappointment uh, 
Yeah, I was that's how, pretty that's how darn I felt. disappointed. Yeah. Yeah, I. Why do you think that is? I don't know. It just seems less. You know, there's less of an energy going on here, and I there's something about the sound of this record that's really bothering me this time. I'm not quite sure what it is. I don't know if it's just if it's the Jocko Joxic mix or not, because I know the this mix is real different from the original it mix. Is. Yeah, like this one is way more open and spacious. You can hear all the parts, but the original mix had a, like a lot more energy and power to it. Like it's heavier. Guitars. Yeah, the guitars lost are the guitars. way forward. Yeah. Yep. And and that makes it a different record to me. And it's almost like the drums have, you know, because the, the 80s King Crimson, especially Discipline, was all about, you know, the interlocking guitar parts. And this album, the at least from the Jocko Joxic mix, I was hearing more interlocking drums as being the, the forefront. And yeah. I kind of got to the point where it's like, I've heard enough drums. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the, I had the same thing and I'm a drum, I like drum person, but uh, I think that drumming, you know, like drum parts like that work better in the most recent King Crimson. I would like, and I'm wondering if it's because of Gavin Harrison's influence. It's like the Bruford and Mastelotto based a lot of their drum interlocking parts on this stuff on a book that Gavin Harrison wrote about drummers playing together. And then oh. Gavin joined the band later. So the, I didn't know the three that. drummers, yeah. So the three drummers having the mastermind in the band, I think helps elevate the material. Like the drum what? parts in the triple drummer Crimson are really incredible. That is some like, you know, far advanced playing. Yeah. You know, I don't think like Bru. I love Bill Bruford, right? But like, I don't think this quite has that energy, except maybe on stage, because this is another Crimson. That's record. a different matter. Yeah. Yeah, this is another Crimson record that does not capture the power that this band has. The double trio King Crimson was freaking amazing live. They yeah. were ferocious on stage. Like, if you look at almost any live recording, you get a completely different group. Like, you get some of the same songs, but they are like to the nth degree of better than this album has shown. Um, we're just kind of disappointing. Couple, yeah. There's a couple of great songs on here, like Vroom and Dakota and Dinosaur, a great way to open an Dinosaur's album. Dinosaur is great. Yeah. Dinosaur is great. I love uh, people and I love sex, sleep, eat, drink, dream, which might be the best song on the record. Quite honestly, they like the whole, like, twisting into this like crazy improv in the middle of the song and kind of going into this other world of sound. That's amazing. It's you almost happy really- family. Yeah, like, it is. I had the same experience where I, I remembered liking this album a lot more than I did. And I think that this album is fine on its own. It's really enjoyable on its own. If you don't compare it to other King Crimson records, but yes, the very nature of this uh, video that we had talked about was was comparison, was ranking. And it's when I started comparing it to other King Crimson records that I started feeling it very much lacking. Um, I find the best material is at the beginning and the end. Um, not the very end, but um, the Vroom, Coda Marine 475, Dinosaur, Walking on Air, all great tracks. I enjoy Baboom. Baboom. I enjoy Thrack. Um, the middle of the record starts to lose me a little bit. The inner garden stuff, you know, it, it's fine, but it gets a little repetitive, you know, with these inner garden one, inner garden two, uh, radio one, radio two people is kind of cool. Um, I enjoy the, the kind of, it's almost like a funky neurotica or something like that. Yeah. Um, busy streets, life it's on the like streets kind of stuff. Like- I think it's like a mix of like neurotica and the Beatles. Like it's a, it's a good pop song, but with that like neurotica, like urgency and menace. There's a ton. Under the thing. There's a ton of Beatles influence on this. Yeah. Album. This is like the poppiest King Crimson album, which is it weird is. to say this and is the one. <laughs> Adrian sounds like John Lennon a lot. A lot yeah. of his vocals remind me of John Lennon, especially sex, sleep, eat, drink, dream. Um, that sounds like, you know, if the that sounds like Beatles in the 90s to me, if the Beatles had 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 been alive yeah. and, and producing music, you know, um, I think it's because like around this time they were releasing all of those like archival Beatles oh, recordings. Yeah. And I think like they play um, on the, either this tour or the next tour. Adrian would encore with Free as a Bird. Which okay. I think it's a John Lennon song. Like I like that leads me to believe he's listening to this stuff. And it's it's all over this music. Well, I think that also the 90s were kind of the first time that 
um, it was the first time that a generation of musicians had come up and started making music that were influenced by the sixties. You know, the eighties were all about getting away from the sixties. Let's not even talk about the Beatles or, or beach boys or any of this stuff. Um, but with, uh, like the grunge bands are referencing, um, the Beatles, uh, smashing pumpkins are playing Mellotrons again, um, and quoting black Sabbath as their favorite band. Um, and I mean, even at this time you have Nirvana, uh, Kurt Cobain is saying that red is one of his favorite records of all time. So I feel like this is a very retro King Crimson album. And I would say that because of that, it's one of the ones that sounds the most dated to me when I, when I listen to it now. Yeah, Um, I agree. But, um, I think I, I need to to reiterate that uh, I don't think this is a poor album. I just think it's not as good as other King Crimson records. And I do think that Dinosaur is a great track. Um, and it's every bit as memorable to me as something like Elephant Talk. Yeah. And also I enjoy hearing the Mellotron come back. In the studio, it's the same Mellotron from In the Court of the Crimson King. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's yeah, cool. there's a picture of it in the... Um, in the booklet, it's very cool. It's the court Mellotron. <laughs> yeah. Which is dope. So, but yeah, so it's, s- it's also <clears throat> has that problem. Like I have the same opinion you do about this album, but I will, you know, I will say part of it is like, it has that 1990s album flow problem. Like that's the other in thing. The it's 90s, long. Yeah. It's long. It's too long. The, uh, the nineties had a problem with that because with the advent of the CD, you know, now you can have, instead of having, you know, an album that's be like 40 minutes. You can have an album be an hour or an hour and yeah. 10 minutes. 80, and everyone minutes. was, yeah, 80 minutes. Everyone and their mother was making albums that were like so bloated and so long. I don't think this is too bloated, but it definitely could be trimmed. And I think would probably be stronger if it was trimmed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, like Ian said, it's a good record. It's just when compared to everything else in the catalog, just about everything else, it's uh, kind of lacking compared to the excellence that's, in the crimson catalog. And I would choose, um, as an experience, I think I would choose the Deja Vroom DVD over Thrack. Yeah, for sure. That's a or better, Vroom, better representation. Yeah. That one or the Vroom Vroom double CD, which I love the pieces. Cause that, that Mexico city show is really electric. Like the Deja Vroom performance is, you know, off the walls stuff. It's yeah. great. So we're going to talk about the construction of light. Yes. So the King Crimson did something very interesting after this album. Uh, and I have the box set. For uh, this that's era. cool. <laughs> yeah. This is the heaven and earth box set, which is kind of, it's kind of interesting because it's really interesting actually. Cause it, what it does is it combines everything post track up until 2008 into a yeah. single package, which is nuts. Cause the Blu-ray discs on this set have every single performance that the projects did. They're all here. It's crazy. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So, so tell, what, what about the projects? Tell, tell us more about that. Yeah. So Crimson did something that I think is really unique that not to, as a creative outlet, they were, you know, trying to do something different, right? You know, there was kind of like a, a stagnation happening, I guess, with the stuff after the double trio finished touring. So instead of like Crimson stopping or trying to rehearse in the studio as a unit, King Crimson decided to split itself and workshop different parts of itself to do different things and try out new material together, but with different members of the same group. And they call this projects with a capital K C like it's crimsonized writing. Um, yeah. And so they, so like the different members would split. So it's not like two guitars, two basses, two drums. Sometimes it's two guitars and a drummer. Sometimes it's two drummers, guitar, bass. Sometimes it's two bass players and a drummer. You know, it's all different. Um, and there were four. Technically, there were more than there were like six, I think. But the, during this time period, there were four. Um, Project two came out first, which is weird because it was conceived second. And Project two is Adrian Ballou, Robert Fripp and Trey Gunn. And on that one, Robert Adrian Ballou plays Roland V drums. This is where electronic drums enter into the Crimson canon. Um, the next was Project one which is Bill Bruford, Robert Fripp, Trey Gunn, and Tony Levin. And this is Bill Bruford's last thing with Crimson. Project One played one single concert, 
and it was a completely improvised show at a jazz cafe in London, mm. which is really cool. They really wanted to maximize the improvisation bit. So what they did was even in the sound check, they did not, they played sound check in isolation so that no one else heard each other or saw each other until going on stage that night. It's very cool. It's a very interesting recording. Um, and then there was project four, which is Tony Levin, Pat Mastelato, Trey Gunn and Fripp, which is essentially like Crimson with two bass players. And then project three, which was Pat Mastelato, Trey Gunn and Robert Fripp, uh, which probably leans closest to what comes next. Uh, it's a very interesting time period. There's a lot of improvisation, a lot of new material that's either workshopped into something you'll hear later or something that is kind of just, you know, thrown away with. Um, I think it's very interesting to hear these things and then hear the next two albums because they do really serve as kind of a capstone. Um, they don't last forever. The projects, they go until about 99 um, on and off really. Then there's like other projects that happen while the next album comes out or after that. Um, but they eventually, Tony Levin leaves for some other obligation and then they record the next album, which is the construction of light. Um, there are two versions of this album now there's the original recording with all electronic drums, and then there's the reconstruction of light, which is in this box set, uh, which Pat Mestalato went and recorded, re-recorded all the drums. And I think also there's a little bit of extra music on the album as well, like little interludes between the frying pan and something else. Um, I almost view them as different albums. I think the original construction of light is probably my least favorite Crimson album, but the reconstruction of light is much better. It is. Yeah, it is much better. Yeah, the drum sound on the original album sucks. It's really thin. Pat Mastelato, like notoriously hated it when it was coming out. And, you know, the material they were running, they all liked. But it's, you know, the album was a disappointment for a lot of them for yeah. sound. Uh, but this is another example of and maybe the best example of a King Crimson album where the live material that came after that was far superior. Uh, this band rocks. This They call this the double duo because it was after the double trio. Um, but the tours that they went on after this album came out are really amazing and very improvisational heavy. You know, it's a really ferocious band and it's kind of sort of not captured on this album also, but kind of in some ways it is because this is a really heavy and intense record. Uh, this might be the most like instrumentally dense King Crimson album is the construction of light. Yeah, I did a review on this um, yes. when I got it. And um, <laughs> excuse me. A lot of my thoughts can be found on that video, so I don't know how much I want to um, reiterate. We don't um, have to rehash too much, yeah. I think the construction of Light, the title track, is far and away the best thing on it. Um, I enjoy Fractured. I enjoy Lark's Tongues and Aspic. I just think that this one doesn't quite get the balance right for me um, between you know the the accessible side and the more... Uh, elaborate side. And this might have something to do with the fact that they didn't perform this music live. It yeah, was written I think in the studio. A, yeah, I think so. It has that composition first uh, way of thinking um, because yeah, some of this is, is like so complex. It just kind of loses me. And then other times I can really dig in and enjoy it um, in a classic King Crimson way. It's uneven. Um, I like the inclusion of the project X track, heaven and earth. Um, some of the stuff doesn't work as well. I, I get a kick out of Prozac blues. It kind of makes me smile. Um, but I think you've said that into the frying pan in the world's my oyster soup kitchen floor wax museum are two of the most forgettable King Crimson tracks. Yeah, I, I hate oyster soup. I, that song stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel that strongly about it, but, um, this is pretty much near the bottom of the pile for me. Also, I agree that reconstruction is better than construction, but oh yeah, I you know I I agree. I think Heaven and Earth and the title track are probably the best things on the album. I really like Lark's Four, but the problem with this record is it's so in your face and it's so intense and heavy and is rarely a break. Even though like pop tunes are either like not good enough to warrant a good break, or they they don't really change the timbre too much either. It's just there's no ballad. Like, there's no ballad. It's an assault. Yeah. Really, I like Prozac Blues a lot. Also, I think this album works best to like listen to it in chunks. Like, do the first couple tunes, 
do something else for a while, come back to it, and then like, wow, Fractured's incredible, and then go and take a half dinner, come back, and then listen to Lark's Floor and be blown away, and then listen to Heaven and Earth and then walk away. It might work better on vinyl. Yeah. If you listen to one side at a time, it might work better. It might um, work better on vinyl. So yeah. um, you have the box set. Tell us about Power to Believe. Yeah, so the double duo, as I mentioned before, went on tour extensively after construction of light and really honed themselves as a, as a ferocious live outfit. I mean, their live recordings on here are ridiculous. Um, but they continued to tour and write new material and they started uh, germinating seeds for another album. Um, and so they did. So they went in the studio with another producer this time, the first time I think since discipline repair. Yeah. Or since discipline. Um, and they, they used a guy named Machine, who is like a, a modern producer, um, and they made The Power to Believe. Uh, some of the material was played live before the album was recorded, so it has a little bit of an edge with uh, honing the material beforehand, most notably Level 5, and I think Electric also was performed live a bunch. And they, they tried to record um, what I think maybe the best two they, they did live, The Deception of the Thrush. Uh, but they couldn't get the rights to use T.S. Eliot's voice, which is a sample in the beginning of the two in the Trey Gun plays. And they just never really worked out a version because part of that piece, especially towards the end, it's really, really serene and beautiful. And it kind of gets quiet. And part of the draw of that is to see how quiet they can get with the audience. I mean, there's recordings where it's like almost mute. There's almost no sound. They felt yeah. like they couldn't replicate that in the studio, which I think is fair. I miss it, but I think it's fair. Uh, and they make the power to believe, which uh, quite honestly is one of the best Crimson records. I think it's a, a it's the last King Crimson album, and I think it works tremendously as a capstone to an amazing career yeah. of albums. You know, it's got everything they do right. Plus, it also has its own thing going on, and it's pushing the envelope in a new way, like Crimson always does. It's really, really tremendous. I listened to this album two days ago, and I really loved it more than yeah. I think ever, honestly. <laughs> It ages it ages tremendously also. It sounds like it does. you know, nothing that came out around this time. It sounds so like head and shoulders above everything else around in two thousand three. Like, it's it's a really kind of a special album, honestly. I think <laughs> I it really is too. Think it is. And yeah. Uh, of this this final three albums, I think it's my favorite. Yeah, me too. Far. It's my favorite post three of a perfect pair. I've always liked it. It was actually one of the first King Crimson records I heard. I think I heard Court of the Crimson King and Red and maybe this one. Um, Me too, actually. Kind of in that order. Is that right? Roughly, yeah. I think my first one might have been Thrak or Lark's Tongues, and then it was Red and Power to Believe. I think Level 5 is one of the all-time classic King Crimson compositions. Yeah. Um, It's also connected to the Lark's Tongues series, which is cool. Um, and, uh, I got a chance to see this live with, uh, with Pat and Trey. Um, and it was, it was really an experience. It was an incredible experience to see this. Um, I love eyes wide open. It's the kind of pop song that I think has been missing from the, the last couple of records. Um, it takes me back to waiting man. Um, yeah. in a way it's, it's just kind of the Adrian's beautiful lyrical simplicity, um, electric is a fun ride with a lot of, you know, peaks and valleys. Um, I love a bit, that tune. A bit like classic King Crimson. Facts of Life um, is, I think, what songs like Oyster Soup tried to be. Um, but this works so much better for me. Um, the Power to Believe 2 is great with the Gamelon influences coming back. And, uh, you know, it's, again, merging the eras Um, you can hear callbacks to the eighties in this album. You can hear callbacks to the seventies crimson, but it also very much looks forward. It's very much pushing the envelope. Once again, dangerous curves, um, is a track that it's almost like, um, talking drum, talking drum. It's talking drum again. It even has the, the dissonant ending, uh, the, the, the jump scare ending, um, (laughs) Happy to happy with what you have to be happy with. Um, that's a track that runs through my head a lot. It's, Maybe doesn't quite fit with the album for me. There's something that, you know, maybe it worked better as the EP track, but I still really like it. I like it in isolation. Um, My issue with this album is that it feels like it's lacking a ending. And I think that it's that deception of the thrush problem. 
they had attempted to record it in the studio but couldn't because as you said the 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 dynamic issue but you know this is the band that released starless and bible black i mean it's not the band but it's the same band name so why not just do a live version throw a live version on that's well recorded that they like the performance of take it back and spruce it up in the studio a little bit if need be but i think it could have been worthwhile to put a live version even as an extra track and there is a live version that's an extra track on the the new version so it's nice to have it there but i think it could have been part of the original album um so that's that's what keeps this album from being like a 10 out of 10 for me um is that it feels like it's less well-rounded as it could be but it's definitely the strongest latter period King Crimson record. And it's one that I have a lot of fondness for. And I feel like if King Crimson never make another record, which looks like it's likely they're to not be going the case. To. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to, um, then this is fine. I'm fine with this as an ending. It's a record that was made 20 years ago, but just like discipline, it sounds like it could have been made yesterday or even tomorrow. Um, so I, I really, I mean, just aside from one song that I feel like should have been on the record, I have nothing but praise uh, for this recording. And it brings back the um, the peace melody idea from from yeah, Wake Up Aside. It brings back, but but you know now it's the power to believe uh, motif. I love but that. Yeah. Again, we're we're bringing all the er, uh, eras together. It's like red. It's like three of a perfect pair. It's just kind of tying all the loose ends together and. I think this album may do that more successfully than those other two records. As much as I love them, this really does feel like, you know, period, the end, on to the next thing uh, yeah. kind of statement. And there's this feeling like if they made another one and it wasn't quite as good, there would be it would be a, a huge disappointment. So I'm happy. I'm happy that this is the final King Crimson record. That was very well said. I agree with you 100%. It is like the really is the perfect capstone to the whole career. <clears throat> uh, you know, I have nothing but praise for this album too. I do think you make a really good point that this should be um, Deception of the Thrush live on the bottom. But you know, I kind of like the the fade out ending. It's kind of nice. It is very anticlimactic and the weakest part of the album, but it's you know very small weakness I think compared to the rest of the album, which is so darn great. Yeah. It's a real treat to listen to. Um, I was really enthralled this time with doing the like with power to believe too that whole middle part of the album is just really special the gamelan coming back and all of the electronic sounds that are like they are far better than the last album like everything that's electronic here is managed really well with acoustic stuff it sounds organic it sounds it's full of life the production's great it really enhances all of this material yeah. it's great um, you can't really beat level five either. That's like you said, the quintessential King Crimson. All right, real quick. I'm yeah. going to, we're going to, we're going to rank these albums all the way through. Um, but before we do that, let's rank Lark's Tongues and Aspic. I'm going to put you on the spot. That's a good question. Rank <laughs> the movements. Okay. Rank the movements. I'm going to do it real fast. All right. You want me to do it off the cuff? You You can do it off the cuff. I'm going to write it down. All right, so for me, the Lark's Tongues movements are Lark's Tongues 3, Lark's Tongues 4, Lark's Tongues 2, Level 5, Lark's Tongues 1. So that's that's an order from least to most favorite? Least to, least to most. So 3 is least favorite, then 4, okay. then 2, then Level 5, and then 1. Okay, give me just a second. Let me put yeah, this together. Yeah. So I think I think Lark's two is my favorite. Level five is second favorite. Uh part three. Part one. And part four. Okay, there's my list. Wow. Least favorite is part four. Second least favorite is part one. Although I do love it. Uh Third is part three. Second favorite is level five. And my favorite all time Lark's Tongues and Aspic part is part two. Wow. Look at Played that. by any band, but 
let me just uh, start a fire in the comment section and say that my favorite recording of Lark's Tongues Part 2 is the Absent Lovers version. No! <laughs> I mean, that version is great. Yeah. I I like it as well as any 70s version. And I also rather enjoy their their rendition of Red. Um, I think more than any subsequent version of Red. Uh, maybe not as yeah. much as the studio version, but I think that that band, there, there's something special by the time you get to Montreal. Um, yeah, 100%. Which, which might be my favorite King Crimson record if we were considering live records, but we aren't. So um, I should have mentioned a long time ago that my notes have failed. That's why I haven't been using them. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of went off the rail and that's fine. But they, but they wouldn't. Well, well, that's just King Crimson. It's the spirit of King Crimson. Yeah. We've we've gloriously gone off the rails, um, and it was it was compelling. But no, the the app is failing on my computer. I can't get it to open and stay open, so I'm having to read it off my phone. Oh God! Um, now that we have arbitrarily ranked the Lark's Tongues and Aspic parts, just for fun, um, we are now going to uh, submit our finalized ranking. Um, of the 12 King Crimson records. And um, the thing to know about this is, at least in my ranking, I was picking the ones that meant the most to me in my top. Like, once you get past the, like, the five mark, they're all masterpieces, is the thing. They're all wonderful records. Um, and uh, it was really just, like, a personal taste thing that, that got me to my number one. But, uh, okay. Number 13, Islands. My least favorite King Crimson record. Um, this is just an arduous task for me. I don't enjoy this record. It's the only one. It's the only one that I cannot find much to say about uh, positively. It sounds tired. Number 12, The Reconstruction of Light. It's uneven. Um, there's not enough relief for me on this record. It's kind of too much of one sort of thing. Number 11, Thrack. I find this the most dated of King Crimson records, uh, aside from maybe Islands. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's a disappointing album. It, it's fine on its own, um, but when compared to other King Crimson records, I think it doesn't come close. Still, there's a couple of good songs, but um, overall, not one of my favorites. Number 10, In the Wake of Poseidon. An album that uh, actually through this process I have grown to appreciate a lot more. Um, and I think it's a really strong album overall. And there's really not much I would change about it. Number nine, Lizard. Lizard is an album that's actually really strong. Like very, very strong. Um, it's the last few minutes of the record that kind of start to uh, lose me. And I think because it doesn't stick the landing it kind of leaves me with sort of a feeling of um, um, it, it, it's unfulfilling. I find, I find lizard unfulfilling in the end, but everything up until that point is great. Number eight, the power to believe. I think this is a really great album. And as I said a few minutes ago, um, it's a nice way to tie together all of the disparate eras of King Crimson. And, uh, if they end here, I'm happy. And it seems like they will. Um, I think this is a strong one to go out on and it's one that doesn't age. It, it doesn't sound like it's part of any era. Um, some of it, you can kind of tell it's from 2003, but, um, it's definitely the strongest of the latter series of records. Number six, three of a perfect pair. This is a very well-rounded record but it's lacking somewhat in its performance. Number seven, beat. I may like three of a perfect pair better overall as an experience, but I think beat is just stronger in performance and the writing to match. Um, especially the, the 5.1 version, the Stephen Wilson remix. It's got the full version of Requiem and the absent lovers instrumental track, I think really helps to uh, cement beat as being a little bit better than three of a perfect pair. Tomorrow, my, my opinion may change. Number five, Starless and Bible Black. This one actually raised up a few. It bumped up a few notches in my ranking. Um, I think that 
this is uh, King Crimson as an improvisational force. Um, as you had said earlier, they're listening to each other really well. And um, any song, any album with the song Fracture on it is is great. It 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 it's it's in the upper echelon as far as I'm concerned. Number four, Red. Now these next two are interchangeable. Uh, they're, they're just about as good for me, but, um, number four is red. I think red is all killer, no filler. There's nothing about this record that I would change. Um, it's one that I reach for quite often. It has an energy to it that when I'm in a certain mood, there's nothing else like it. Number three in the court of the crimson King. This is just an all time classic album. And I actually think red might be a little bit better specifically Providence, the, the improv, um, I would place it above Moonchild. But In the Court of the Crimson King is so iconic. And so I, I just, I have to bump it up one notch, I think, at least today. Ask me tomorrow, it might be different. Number two, Lark's Tongues in Aspic. It's very nearly my number one. Um, this, is a, a, this is a movie for your ears. It's a cinematic, it's a work of cinema, is, is what it is. It's, it's music as cinema. Um, if you handed this to someone as their first King Crimson record, I think they would have a pretty good idea what this band is all about. Number one, Discipline. Discipline just goes down a little bit easier. Um, it's an album that, again, hasn't aged today. You put it on and it sounds like it could have been made yesterday. Um, and, uh, most importantly, I think it's got replay value a little bit above Lark's Tongues and Aspic and In the Court of the Crimson King. Both of those albums and to a a certain extent, three of a perfect pair are records that I need to sit down and really absorb and let them wash over me. Whereas discipline I can enjoy while doing other things if I want to, but it still is textured enough that um, when I do sit down and listen to it uh, as a piece of music, it works on that level too. Um, And it's also the eighties band is my favorite. What can I say? I just think that they were, they were wonderful. Um, so Mike, let's hear your list. What's your ranking? Good list, Ian. <laughs> All right. So my list, um, my number 13 is Islands. Um, Islands is for me far away the weakest King Crimson album. Um, it's the only one I would probably rate like below a seven. Uh, it's just, you know, rather unfocused. It's quiet. It's tired. It's exhausting. Um, it's got a couple of good songs, but really doesn't hold a candle to everything else in the catalog for me um number 12 is the construction of light i think like ian said this is quite a bit of a step up from islands uh, but it's still not quite as great as everything else uh, there's a couple songs i don't like especially oyster soup i think that is not a good song um it's just you know it has, some, it has some great stuff going on it's very complex but it's a sort of salt it's a sonically hits you over the head for an hour. It's way too long for that. And that's why it's so low on the ranking. Uh, number 11 is Thrack. Um, this is the biggest surprise personally for me. Uh, I used to love this record, but it's, you know, as an album by itself, it's great. But uh, as compared to the other Green Crimson albums, it's just pretty okay. You know, it's the most dated album in the catalog. And, you know, it's got a couple of good songs, but it's just too long. Number 10 is Three of a Perfect Pair. Um, another one that I used to love and has fallen quite a bit. I still think it's a great album. This is the point where the albums are really good to great and everything above it is I just like more than that. There's a couple of things on Three of a Perfect Pair I think are just OK. The performances are kind of cold. That's why it's down here at number 10. Um, number nine is In the Wake of Poseidon. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most underrated albums in the catalog. I think it's great. It's got a lot going for it. It's different from Court. It's got a lot of merit. It's a fun album. I just like everything else better <laughs> above it. Um, number eight is Beat. Uh, the other album, I would say, is maybe the most underrated in the catalog. It slaps. It's a fun time. It's a really strong record. Great writing. It sounds good. Perfect uh, for Pop Crimson. Um Number seven is Lizard. This is the point where these are the albums that I really, truly love. And from Lizard up is a masterpiece in my eyes. Uh, Lizard is a wonderful experimental record. It's really jazzy, which is right up my alley. It's a real odd duck, and I love it for it. 
Um, I just think if I have to be a little bit objective in my ranking, all the albums that are above this one are better. Um, number six is Discipline. This album is a masterpiece. It's timeless. You know, it could have been recorded next week. It could have been recorded 30 years ago. It's incredible how this music sounds. It still sounds fresh and inviting. I just think I played it too much. It would used to be like number two, but I just played it too much for myself. And I think me as a listener lately has been gravitating more towards like an experience where I have to sit down and be washed by music rather than like music to do chores to, which discipline can do both. But I just am gravitating towards more of the wash me in this. I have to be absorbed into this album now experience. Um, number five is power to believe this surprised me this album also sounds timeless and you know it's not dated it is a terrific capstone to an amazing career of, of music that crimson has put together um i love it i think it's an amazing record it sounds great it's got a lot of invented material um you know it's heavy and i like the heaviness in this one it's far and away better than everything else in modern crimson it's great uh number four is starless and bible black I love the improv. This band is firing on all cylinders. The material is really strong. It's a great sounding album too. It's a ton of fun. And this is the one where every time you put this record on, you hear something different. There's something new to grab onto every time you hear it. And I love it for it. Uh, number three is in the court of the Crimson King. Uh, an incredibly important record for my life. Um, you know, there's not much more to say. I do think the reason it's not number one is because the Moonchild improv is not as strong. And the two above this one, I just think are better albums, as great as this one is. Um, the next two, honestly, if you if you uh, were to ask me tomorrow what my favorite Crimson album is, it might be this one. And my number two is Red. Um, I just love this thing. It's very special to me. The The music's amazing. It sounds massive. Sometimes I kind of want to cry when I listen to it because it's that emotionally arresting for me. Um, it's a wonderful album. Um, I love it to pieces. And number one is Lark's Tongues and Aspic. This is a, I would consider this a bona fide masterpiece of an album. And maybe this might be the best album for me, like of all time by anybody now. Yeah. It's just that good. And a mere truly special record that will wow you upon listening every time, even after all these years of listening to this music, it still brings the wow factor. That's why it's my number one. Yeah, very, very well said. All right. Well, um, thank you for joining us and sticking it out for what I'm guessing is going to be kind of a long video because we talked a little bit longer than intended, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's been a lot of fun. Don't forget um, to comment with your ranking. We would love to hear from you how you feel about these King Crimson records. Which one is your least favorite? Which one is your favorite? Um, and everything in between. Um, don't forget to also like this video. We respond to enthusiasm, as a wise man once said. Um, and uh, don't forget also to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this, because Mike and I plan to do more things in this duo format um we intend to talk about yes is fragile at some point um in the near future and um i think we're going to come back and do zappa at the whiskey with Chaco. i think that's yes. still on the the uh itinerary is there anything else you want to say to the folks at home uh before we sign off for the evening yeah please tell us your ranking and tell us which albums you think are the underrated ones or the dark horses in that catalog we'd love to yeah. hear that Maybe we'll like change opinion. our minds. Yeah, who knows? Give us a good argument. And yeah. don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah, thanks All for right. listening. <laughs> thanks for listening. And uh, thank you again, Mike, for, for joining and doing this crazy long video with me. Happy this was to a do lot it. of fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Sounded all right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear from us soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.